Hi, everyone, and welcome to Last Gas 50th Anniversary Comic-Con Panel Part 2. Uh, this time, we're going to talk about the period roughly from the early 1990s all the way through 2020. It's a huge amount of time to cover in a very short amount of uh, time. So um, what are we going to talk about? Uh, we're going to talk about the rise of lowbrow art, uh, various offshoots, pop surrealism, street art, uh, and so first what I'm going to do is uh, go around and talk to everybody, have everyone introduce yourselves and uh, say a little short bit about how you came to be connected with Last Gasp and Ron Turner. Um, but before we do that, I just want to look back really briefly um, at, at the past uh, 25, 30 years and not counting the first half of the history as looking back and doing a rough count. It looks like we published over 400, three to 400 books or graphic novels in the last 25 years to 30 years. Uh, a lot of those in big hardcover formats. Um, and a lot of those were just last gasp publications, but many, many of them were done in conjunction with uh, various galleries. Uh, La Luz de Jesus Gallery in LA, run by Billy Shire, Laguna Art Museum, Grand Central Art Center, and a lot more, um, <clears throat> Copper and Mason, and so forth. So it's been a big shift from the early days of publishing underground comics to now doing deluxe art books, uh, but there is a connection and, and through all of that. And so uh, I want to start with, with, uh, with Robert Williams. Um, Last Gasp has published your work in various forms over the years, comics to fine art hardcovers. So Robert, can you talk a little bit, describe your relationship with Last Gasp and with Ron Turner? <clears throat> Um, and absolutely. Um, you you uh, confine this conversation to the to the, the, the 90s. This this situation started its irritating journey way before that. <laughs> you know, it's uh, if if you start digging in the roots of this, you know, you you realize Ron Turner and uh, Last Cast has always been there always been there and uh, if you look at lowbrow art or alternative art you'll you'll see it really start rearing its head up during the psychedelic poster era and then that graduated into underground comics and uh, when i say underground i mean real underground uh in conflict with a lot of social mores that uh, uh were uh, premier at the time uh Ron has always been there, and Ron was a, a, a very strong force that uh, we, we could always fall back on. There was there was a large number of publishers through the years that did underground publications. The vast majority of them turned out to be flaky, and Ron was the the, the steadfast uh, father that uh, we all depended on, and he ended up with the best titles. He ended up with Zap Comics and whatnot. And as uh, <clears throat> as um, Time went by and the underground comics faded. Then uh, uh, spontaneously, a, a form of underground painting developed, and uh, uh, <clears throat> that, 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 that's what we're dealing with right now in this conversation. Is this uh, this alternative form of art, and it, it, it spawned uh, uh, a couple of publications of its own, Juxtapose and High Fructose, uh, uh, very wonderful publications that have. Um, pretty mu pretty much made this um, art form uh, uh, valid through the United States and parts of Europe. And so I don't know. I I, I, I don't want to go into a long-winded thing here, <clears throat> but there there are some points of, of significance that uh, I should mention, and then I'll pass it on here. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 uh, <clears throat> There was a, in the late '80s. There was a, a, a large group of artists building up. They were uh, alienated from the formal art world, and they they were very talented people. The, the the art world had been bathing and wallowing itself, and for years, in abstract expressionism. I don't I don't mean to run down any form of art, but abstract expressionism dominated the art world for a long time, and then after that came minimalism and conceptualism who um, uh, pretty much were also in cahoots with uh, making sure that representational and narrative art never got a foothold again. But the, nonetheless, in the, in the uh, 80s, there, uh, there was enough representational artists that we just uh, automatically kind of bonded together. 
and um, me and uh, Greg Escalante, my wife Suzanne, Craig Stesick, and a couple other people started a publication called Juxtapose. I uh, <clears throat> I went to the Zap artist. I had a meeting with the Zap artist at the uh, farmers market in Los Angeles, and and, and got their help to, and, and their promises that uh, I was coming out with another publication, a new publication about uh, fine arts underground painting, and, and and I had their pledge that they would help me all they could. So I I, I had an orthodox beginning on uh, a juxtaposed magazine from 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 its uh, conception. But the, the the thing was, when Juxtapose came out, you know, Ron watched all of this happen. Ron was right in the middle of all this. When when Juxtapose came out, no art school would allow it in their classes. It was just <laughs> forbidden. And. Uh, the, the the circulation on juxtapose built and built and built and it was it was very hard to ignore juxtapose because there's starting to become some very very talented people and the circulation went bigger and bigger and bigger so it it, it had uh, got its own thr- threshold it, it had grasped onto a, its own significance in the art world and it could no longer be ignored now. Uh, let me conclude here to tell you exactly how far this thing got at one time. Uh, there was a fella in the art world named Walter Hobbs. Uh, and Andrea knew of Walter. And Walter Hobbs was one of the most important and premier people in the fine arts world in the second half of the 20th century. He uh, got to Andy Warhol, his first show. He brought uh, Marcel Duchamp uh, to the United States for his first show since 1913. <clears throat> he made all the top artists on the West Coast, Ruscha and Ed Keen Holtz and all those important people. And he was pretty much revered all over the world. Well, in 19... 19- uh, 71 at the Corcoran Museum in Washington, D.C., he had a zap show. This is how hip Walter was. A zap show in 71, that was unheard of. So he had a fundamental understanding of the underground, and he loved Juxtapose magazine. But Walter was getting old, and he had a lot of medical problems. And before he died, he was designated as the premier museum functionary on planet Earth in Europe and the United States. There are standards in uh, quirks and museums now that follow his standards that he set. Well, Walter was a very close friend of mine, and I knew Walter pretty good. <clears throat> so in, in uh, uh, 2001, I was confronted by some people that said that they had some financial backing to do a big uh, outlaw uh, lowbrow art show. <clears throat> and who, could I help them out? And uh, could I find someone that would represent, could represent them at a, a big museum? And I said, well, I'll talk to Walter Hobbs. And I went to Walter, and Walter says, yeah, I'd be very interested in something like this. So um, at the same time, Walter was working on a show at the Guggenheim that would have lowbrow art in it called uh, the Images Show. So Walter uh, Walter got became ill, and he told me, well, I'm, I'm, I cannot curate this show for you, but I'm going to pass it off on Henry Hopkins, the, the director of uh, um, uh, UCLA. And I went and talked to um, – I had a meeting with uh, – Henry Hopkins, and Henry Hopkins was very interested in having this big show. You know, this would have changed everything for us. But Henry Hopkins up and died. I wrote a, I wrote a, a, a an eight-page treatise to explain the direction of all the artists and the, the need to, to have a foothold back into representational and narrative art, and they all understood this. So then Henry died. So I thought, well, I'll just, you know, that's too bad. That's about our, about our luck. And then along Jeffrey Deitch here about five years ago, and I'd explained it to Jeffrey Deitch. And Jeffrey Deitch at this time was the director of MOCA, and he was really interested in this show. But he just had, just in the middle of having that uh, all-city show with the, the street scene, and this caused such a, such a scandal that they threw him out of MOCA. 
So uh, we have just been missing the trolley by inches. You know, our fate has just been just been missed. And uh, Walter didn't live long enough to have the big show at Guggenheim. And I talked to the people at the Guggenheim Museum in New York, and they says, "Well, that program went when uh, Walter died." So um, I thought I'd leave you with this little bit of positive tidbit. Tidbit that there will be, there is a, a very strong future and important people watching us. And I'm, I'm going to pass right now, and you go on to someone else. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Robert. That, you know that that uh, lowbrow um, scene and in, in the museum involvement was you know really uh, tied to Last Gasp's um, fortunes in the '90s. You know we were in, intertwined with, with Juxtapose a lot and doing things together with them and with Billy Shire. Uh, did custom culture, uh, the catalog for that show at Laguna Art Museum, a lot of tiki related things, the uh, art, Ed Big Daddy Roth, Rat Fink. Um, sure. And so I wanted to go to Andrea. Um, yes. Andrea, can you introduce yourself? And, and you know, we, we talked a little bit earlier, we worked on a number of projects together, uh, mm -hmm. something like eight or, or so books. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you just uh, introduce yourself and talk about your, your work with Last Gasp and Ron? My name is Andrea Harris, and um, I, like Colin had said, we've worked on a lot of projects together that were really amazing to bring to fruition for our artists. Um, I met Ron, believe it or not, I don't even think he remembers me, but when Custom Culture was featured at Laguna Art Museum, I was actually one of the installers on that job, and I actually was installing the show uh, when they were all bringing the work in, and Robert was there, a lot of people were coming down, um, and I uh, met Ron at the opening, um, everybody was telling me um, to meet him, so I introduced myself, but I was just a kid, 21 years old, you know, green, and just beginning in my art life in uh, Southern California. And uh, later on, I would go on to become a director for the Grand Central Art Center in Santa Ana and uh, work for Cal State University Fullerton. And we would rekindle our friendship and begin to publish books together. Um, and it was kind of brought together because of my relationship with Robert and with Greg Escalante. Um, but Ron and I really hit it off and he became my mentor. I wanted to learn about publishing and I wanted to make the most beautiful um, art books possible. I had I, seen books and, and read and I really felt there was a lot of things in the art world that were not of the quality that we wanted to go for. And Ron was game and willing to collaborate with amazing designers and with the university and our academic side, um, and we, we pulled off some epic books. We were very, very proud of the collaboration. And you know, I wouldn't have been in the, in, in the position to do what I have done unless Ron was there to mentor me. And so I'm very, very honored to have been able to work with him. Um, I wanna just say that the titles that we produced, you know, again, they're, they have very, very high readers. People love the books. Some of the people I meet and run into this day, they are in the design world or in theater or in film. They'll contact me and say, I just read this book. It's the most amazing book. And I can't believe you were involved in that project. I said, just keep looking at Last Gas titles and you'll find the most amazing history of publications. And they do. They keep picking up another book from Last Gas and they're like, how in the heck does it, you guys give the best material to Last Gas? They always get the best projects. And um, I told him it's because, you know, Ron was wide open to try. And, and he also really let us have artistic freedom um, he believed in us. He he really felt that, you know, we were going to bring up something important and really, really realize something um, important for the art world and for art history. And that's what we were going for. And we, and we nailed it. And, you know, for 10 years, I worked with him on projects. And I'm just so proud. You know, I, I got to work with Camille, who's on our panel, and with Lori Lipton. Um, I worked with Charlie Kraft, who recently passed, and, you know, Edward Culver on the punk scene uh, for Blight at the End of the Funnel. Um, you know, it, 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 you know, Basil Wolverton was something that people, you know, they knew Basil, but they didn't know Basil. When we did that book, it blew the roof off uh, people's idea of what that um, artist was capable of. And Basil is phenomenal. The, the Glenn Bray collection is exquisite. So, you know, we've been very lucky um, in, in this collaboration. And again, I'm so grateful to Ron and for 50 years, you know, to be going strong. I'm just really proud to be a part of it. I see behind you, you've got go uh, Lori Lipton's work. Yeah, yeah, this is the one from the cover of the book, uh, Round and Round. Yeah. She so says you know, hello. <laughs> um, 
I wanted to go to you, Camille, um, and uh, just talk a little bit about uh, your work. Uh, maybe you can introduce yourself and, and talk a little bit about it, but uh, by way of introduction, um, Camille, we, I think we've done three books together. Yeah. Um, Tragic Kingdom, uh, The Saddest Place on Earth, and Mirror, Black Mirror. Yeah. Um, and they're all incredible, beautiful books. I'm uh, really mm -hmm. proud of them. And, you know, your work is very um, beautiful and ornate, uh, and you have a high level of craft uh, and talent. And, you know, we were talking with, with Robert, I've talked on numerous occasions, you know, about how uh, craft has not been so respected. Uh, but you have, but you also, I think the thing that makes your work resonate uh, is the political mm -hmm. and environmental themes, which are things that resonate with Last Gasp. Right. And why it's important, uh, you know, to publish. So with that, could you maybe describe a little bit about yourself and your work? Sure. Um, I'm Camille Ruiz Garcia, uh, LA native, born and raised. Um, parents were both, yes, <sighs> they went to, they met in San Francisco at the Art Institute and they were sort of like beatnik artists, um, you know, uh, and they continued. My dad, uh, did filmmaking. My mom was a painter, a professional painter for her whole life. Um, she's still painting. Um, so I was kind of raised by, you know, that sort of like 60s counterculture was sort of ingrained in my upbringing in terms of it seemed normal to um, be able to be an artist, be able to, to, to contribute to society, I guess, in that way. It wasn't like a far off um, sort of pipe dream. It was part of, um, what I believe to be believe. Really like the truest sense of um, reflecting culture, we need our artists, musicians, and writers. And even though our the mainstream culture here in the US, I feel like doesn't always embrace that, you guys being there to represent the un underground and kind of etch it in history permanently by having these books, um, you know, it's been really important because it seems like we sort of, lived through a golden age, I guess, of publishing and of the underground being able to be documented in this way that, you know, going forward, I don't know, you know, if it will slip back in the underground, if it will be harder to do. Um, anyway, but the, the main themes of my work, which sort of have to do with the intersection of, of capitalism and, and the natural world and how do we reconcile um, our uncomfortable relationship with it. Uh, those are the main themes of my work. Um, in terms of sort of, I guess, like once I moved up to the woods here, which was in 2007, uh, I sort of started to include more nature into the work, uh, more like mushrooms and lush uh, flowers and um, things from my environment because the focus became more like trying to imbue the magic back into the world that I felt was maybe being kind of white. Um, so I don't know, I guess that's kind of, I'm rambling a little bit, but uh, there's so much to say. There's so many points of reference to kind of cross connect, but um, Robert, uh, you know, you're certainly the, the underground culture and counterculture and Ron, you know, you guys are all there in the Bay area of, the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s really, um, to me, resonates completely, and I'm a, it's honored. I'm just honored to be a part of that continuation and that sort of critical commentary of culture where there is no other critical commentary of culture <laughs> existing. Okay, is that well? Thank you, I yeah, appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Ron English. I wanted to go to Ron uh, English. Um, we started working together, I think, on this book, Propaganda, which was originally done by uh, Soft Skull, uh, and then we took it over for a reprint and expanded edition. And then since then, we've worked on a few different um, decks, uh Abject Expressionism. This is a the cover image from Satisfactory, it's uh, not the actual cover, um, and some sticker books. Uh, but Ron, I wanted to talk to you about, and just, you know, you can introduce yourself a little bit because you have, you're more than just painter, you, you have so many um, hats that you wear. Uh, can, you, can you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about working with Last Gasp? Uh, 
and, and Ron Turner. <clears throat> yeah, my name is Ron English and I am an artist and a musician. Um, <laughs> no, I, the weird thing about the last cast book was um, it already been published um, by Soft Skull, but uh, a weird conglomeration of stuff was happening. And now um, Ron had helped out um, the Air Pirates in the, in the 70s. So that was something I was very familiar with. And they were, you know, basically doing alternative stories with um, Disney characters, which was, you know, super controversial. And um, they had a lot of lawsuits with, with Disney. And, he, and so Ron was helping them through all that. And then he also knew that, um, I believe in 1990 or maybe it was 1999, I can't remember, um, that the Mickey Mouse copyright was gonna expire. So that meant it was gonna be you know, wide open. And so he just sort of said, look, you know, when I've been waiting this whole time for the copyright to expire, which, it, which is something that should happen. It's, it's, you know, stuff goes back into the public domain that, that helps creativity. And it's sort of something we'd all agreed on for a very long time. And uh, it didn't happen. And he was going to do a big you Mickey Mouse book. And then he goes, you know what? Um, I know they'll probably sue us, but I, I want to redo propaganda. And I want, I want to put Mickey with Marilyn. Uh, Marilyn with Mickey's on the, on the cover. Just to say, like, as a few to Disney. So um, we never got sued, but uh, that was kind of how we got together. Hmm. That was but, um, yeah, there it is. My history is I've actually kind of weirdly been a part of all these movements. I almost feel like that um, I flitted from movement to movement. So like in 1989, or I'm sorry, 1979, I started doing these fabricated photographs where you build stuff like in reverse perspective into an environment and you take a picture. And it was, it, it was a movement called Fabricated to be Photographed, which is very similar to uh, the film movement dogman where you can't change the lights or do anything like that. Well, with fabricated to be photographed, whatever happened, you know, in front of the camera had to really happen. It was super fantastical. You had to go out into the environment and made that happen, which is also how I got into running around the country repainting billboards. Because, like, if I was shooting a scene and it had five billboards in the background, I didn't want them to be Budweiser ads. I wanted them to relate to the other stuff that I was creating in the photograph. So I had to go repaint the billboards. And then the billboards kind of actually, in a weird way, became more famous than the photographs. So, so, so now, first I was in this fabricated to be photographed. Now I'm in this other movement in the early '80s that you know that was the early street art movement. You know, so Keith Haring was involved, uh, Kenny Scharf, a little bit of Basquiat. Um, there were a lot of graffiti writers, but they were kind of a bit of a different thing. So I kind of rode that movement, you know, and the East Village art movement through through the uh, '80s, and then then by the end of the 80s, the whole thing kind of blew up and Jeff Koons became the big artist and everybody was tired of East Philly expressionism and, and street art. And But meanwhile, like on the West Coast, there was this movement of the lowbrow artists kind of brewing. So weirdly, I kind of got hooked in with them and I got to ride the, the wave. You know, I think one of my best friends back then was like Anthony Osking and he helped introduce me to that whole world. And um, it, for a long time, there was this big scene called lowbrow in um, LA and I think I was the only member of the Lip Rob movement that was uh, from the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And then, then that kind of ended up morphing into pop surrealism. And, you know, my take is just my take. I don't know if it's correct or not. But it, I felt like that um, a lot of people that had been involved in the world of illustration were kind of losing their jobs because of computers. And it was easier to make, you know, the art without actually having an artist do it. And so then they kind of looked to the art world and said, well, that looks like fun. You just make whatever you want, you sell it. I mean, it's not like you get advance money, but it, it, it sounds like a funner place to be and it's going to be more your vision. And so they came into the art world and I came, you know, I kind of rode along with them. And then they, they sort of found out like the art world didn't really want them and they didn't like illustrative looking art or, you know, figurative art. Um, but, you know, we're actually this whole group of really super talented artists ended up creating a completely new art world where they got some very major people in Hollywood and some very major people to start buying this art. So suddenly they had their own galleries, they had their own collectors, they had this completely al alternative art world. And I kind of rode that way for a while until one day, you know, this guy Shepard Ferry comes out and a lot of people were trying to revive the street art that we were doing in the 80s. A lot of people that kind of grew up seeing that thought that was pretty cool. And so when they all started getting involved in that, the whole time I've been still doing, been doing the street art, but suddenly I got swept up in that for the next eight years. Suddenly they were thinking, well, who's the OG 
you know, street art guy. And then they, it was just decided, I didn't decide this, um, that I was the godfather of street art since I started doing it in the 70s. And so then I got a lot of love for that. And I got to take a ride, you know, around the entire world, you know, creating hot, huge murals and doing big shows and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then the pandemic came. And uh, so I, I don't, now, now nobody's really out there doing street art. And um, weirdly, now I've retreated to Beacon, New York, and to where I live here in, in a very isolated place. And, and for the last few months, I've only become like Henry Darger. I'm like a weird guy. I haven't left my house in three months and I'm just in my basement making crazy. Mm -hmm. And um, thankfully I I talked to to Colin and I said, I just want to stay locked down for a year. And I want to do this thing that I've always done. I have this world called Delusionville with all these characters and it's very complicated. I've designed every plant, every religion and everything. And if I could super concentrate on this for a year, I could deliver a book called the grand Delusion That would just be this insane once in a lifetime thing. And, uh, you know, when they, when the, uh, when, on January 1st, I, I literally had every day booked for the, the next year and a half. Well, I mean, what, one guy was going to give me a million dollars to make a painting in, in China. And then I mean, just one thing after the other all over the world, suddenly it was all gone. And so that opened up this opportunity to create this thing that I've wanted to create it for a very, very long time. And so Colin said, okay, we're, we'll do the book. So for the next year, I'm going to try to stay focused on doing that. And also my, um, there's, there's a parallel to that. Um, I've done music this whole time in various forms, but um, for the last few years, I have a band called The Rabbits. It's R-A-B-B-B-I-T-S. There's three Bs. You know, I've sold a lot of records from some other rabbit, Rabbits band. There's only <laughs> two Bs. But it, it, it's, it's what I do is I get all, the, all these characters, these um, uh, opera singers and famous singers to sing all the parts of all my characters to help you understand who the characters are in each um, record is it like a double album and it tells like an entire story of this world delusion bill so so now i'm getting to create the whole visual side of it and then i've also been able to create like the whole musical side of it and we just dropped an album two weeks ago called uh, we are the new day and it's on spotify and it's on uh, mm-hmm. itunes and it's not hard to find you just have to remember rabbits has three b's so, so that's where i'm at but it's weird like when i i first learned about henry darger and all the weird outsider guys and the guys that never nobody knew what they were doing you know, it was very interesting to go be in a very, very public figure to suddenly be in this weird guy that n- now nobody knows what I'm doing anymore. And I'm just, I'm just going to make stuff for a long time before anybody sees it. It's, it's been an interesting ride. <laughs> you know, that's yeah, my story. To doing that. Yeah. We're looking forward to doing that book. You know, I found, uh, when, yeah, I mean, when it's, it's cause it's like, it's like, like writing the Hobbit or, I mean, you're thinking of everything and every character and what do they think and how do they interact with each other and what are their weird philosophies. And a lot of it's, you know, it's kind of poetry because it's the lyrics from all the albums. So, you know, I think it's going to be the most most amazing thing I'll, I'll probably achieve in my life. I think, you know, I'm, I'm already like 60 years old, so I don't think that after I achieve this, I think that I'm probably just going to run around the world and doing, I'll just do the Ron English thing, but I probably won't ever get to be this inventive. Amazing. Oh, you might get another virus. Oh no. <laughs> you might get another virus. Yeah, I already got the virus once and then um and then and everybody it, we all got it in New York together, we believe. And um so some of the people that got it um have immunity. Um they got, you know, the, the white blood cells or whatever you get. And then a lot of us aren't immune, we'll get it again. So uh, my doctor says, yeah, like a family will get it. And one will get immunity, and the other three won't get the antibodies. So it's a weird scene. Um, so I want to turn. Uh, don't want to cut you off, but I want to turn and, and get some time for uh, for everyone to talk here. So uh, Ada Boy, um, I want to turn to you, Ada. Um, we work together on a lot of projects. Uh, in addition to projects we've done, you've done some design work for us. We published books with you. Um, but you also, we also did three deluxe uh, high fructose collected editions. Um, Ada, can you talk a little bit about high fructose and how you connected with Last Gasp and how Last Gasp fits into the, the pop surrealist and, and sort of the new contemporary uh, art world, you know, the, the world that you cover in, in, uh, in your magazine? Oh, you're, you're muted, Ada. You're muted. Unmute yourself. 
There we go. Okay. There it is. I was going back to my uh, performance poetry days. Uh, mm -hmm. Doing a Mar Marcel Marceau quote there. But um, so my name's Adam, an artist, and uh, my wife and I co founded High Fructose uh, Magazine. Co founded is probably a weird thing because we publish it, we do way too many aspects of the business or the publication. It's more of a publication than a business. That has to be a business to be a publication. Anyways, it eats itself all the time. Um, I started, you know, this is an interesting thing. I was thinking about this, but um, we, my wife and I, and by the way, we have d different, we don't agree on much and we kind of discuss things in the pages of the, of the magazine to each other. So it's that kind of a publication. Um, but um, we, uh, we both grew up in the suburbs and these there were these little gems that we'd find in record stores in head shops in tattoo parlors uh i found the church of subgenius book i found uh when i was going to art school for toy design i found robert williams book on on the floor of some guy's dorm and it just blew my mind mm -hmm. um we uh, both of us were really influenced by these little gems we'd find and the idea that you could do anything you wanted You didn't a need to ask permission To do like the churches of genius. They came up with their own religion mm. And I was like you can't do that. You're not allowed to do that And so that idea of asking permission like we weren't we didn't have to ask permission to create our own reality or the things we wanted to or to do our trade and that's kind of been a theme for the things that I do. Um, and that's how we started the magazine, which is weird with a, um, we just thought you start a magazine and then at the ads would roll in and then we'd support it. <laughs> and that's not how it worked. Uh, so we borrowed $10,000 from my brother uh, and we paid him back. And uh, then it, this thing just kind of started uh, taking off. Um, we started out, um, mm -hmm thinking it was called High Fructose Toy Exploitation Magazine because the art toys were a big deal at the time. But, um, and then it turned into High Fructose uh, Under the Counter Culture, which is kind of a, we love double entendres, right? Or double entendre giants and things like that. So, um, and then it became uh, the High Fructose, we needed a blanket statement that would kind of, kind of, um, because we loved, you know, uh, there was a lot of street art going on at the time. We love the street art of like like what Ron did or, or um, Billboard Liberation Front or folks like that, real culture jammers and things like that. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to uh, show art from all, you know, somebody's backyard. So the idea being like Barry McGee next to Basil Wolverton mm -hmm. and how they're similar but different and kind of put them right next to each other and somebody uh, in something even from the blue chip world that was like Erwin Worm, but next to something that was completely underground. So we like that. Um, and then, so we need a blanket statement. So we call it new contemporary art, which is redundant and stupid and, and a big blanket statement. But that was the point. The point was that it could grow and it wouldn't just be you know, because pop surrealists were saying, but, you know, but wait a minute, I'm doing nature themes, but I'm not doing pop because I'm not referencing pop culture. So everybody was fighting each other and stuff. And we're like, well, let's, let's use, use a, a really a big st a blanket thing. So that's kind of how, and then the publication grew. But I started with um, seeing Last Gas through all these little gems that would, that would pop up. I did a, a, a poetry book. I was a performance poet while I was a toy designer at Milton Bradley and at Hasbro and that night I put my hat on and then like jump on tables and stuff and yell at people. And then I made a book about that called Gush and then that was distributed by Last Gasp. And that was, I mean, the publications are amazing and, and artifacts with art effects, but th also the distribution that Last Gasp did for such a long time was like a, a real godsend to people before the internet, um, especially people who couldn't see things that were different, people in Arkansas mm -hmm. uh, who just didn't know that they weren't, they weren't alone, you know? Um, yeah. so that, that was a, a real big thing. And, and Ron is one of the, I have, there's a list of like three people who I'm very, um, I get very nervous when I'm talking to, mm -hmm. and Ron is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why is Ron, Ron, I mean, he's wonderful. It's not, it's, it's no fault, the fault of, of Ron's, but it's, He's created, him and Colin, they created something from, from nothing that, from the heart, you know, and something that they've made their own world. And like people like John Waters, who I was an idiot in front of one time. So there's a very few, there's like John Waters, Ron, 
I, mean, I don't know. Well, you know, most of them are dead, but uh, the other people, but there's very few people who, um, and, and I just respect it so much that people can, and, and that's the kind of spirit I, I try to do with the projects that we do. We did those collected edition books uh, with, with Last Cast. Oh, we, we showed other publishers, you know, we had a magazine, but it would sell out all the time, right? So, because we could only afford it the, in the beginning to make it so many, and it would always sell out. So we said, let's, uh, sorry about the dog. Um, so we said, let's, uh, let's combine them in this wonderful deluxe set. And people thought it was ridiculous. And, and, and uh, last cast said, you know, let's, uh, let's do it. And then I said, okay, can we put a face mask in it? Yes. And so we asked Mark Ryden and we're like, Mark, we want to use your image, not for print, not for something, but we want to put people's great greasy faces on your image. And we want to make a face mask with, with a ribbon in the back. And he was like, awesome, let's do it. <laughs> and so that was, and then we did velvet prints that took like a million different factories to figure out and all these really deluxe things for the art of it. Um, and people seem to appreciate it. And, and that's um, been a real great thing. And I'm so sorry about the pug, but uh, that's, I, I know I'm rambling, but. Um, yeah, no, that's, you know, you, you bring up a point, which I just want to mention, you know, as part of my uh, philosophy um, in publishing, which, you know, was alluded to by Andrea is like, um, that we trust our artists and we trust our designers um, to come up with their own vision and to not, you know, some publishers have a, some of you look at a book, you know, that's a book from that particular publisher, you know, has a look and feel. But for us, it's like, we want it to have the look and feel of the artist or the designer of that particular project, not that it's a last gas book. And we have our own aesthetics, you know, so, you know, like when Ron proposes, let's do a, you know, book on Delusionville, I'm just going to trust that he, he has a vision, you know, that he's the, the artist, you know, when you guys wanted to make these deluxe editions, that sounds crazy, but I trust that you're going to make it special and that's what makes it different and unique and, you know, why not? Yeah, it. they've been reprinted, what, four or five different times already, so it just, uh, the, the books themselves, so it just, it's, amazing if you I, I think people notice i hope if if i don't know we're all still here right so yeah so <laughs> john cook has been waiting patiently <laughs> hey john um i wanted to have you on today because um you uh, are the author of one of our most recent publications the book of weirdo which is nominated for an eisner award so congratulations john cool um and you're also editing two other books for Last Gas, but I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about a book of Weirdo and about the projects that you're working on right now. Well, I, I really like Attaboy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I really like uh, how Attaboy uh, talked about the, how receptive uh, Last Gas is. And, you know, my story is that I started off this retrospective of Weirdo magazine as a it was literally was going to be 30 pages. And I, I, I published magazine. Uh, I, I, Pardon me, I edit my own magazines. I've been doing it for 20 years on comic books. And this thing, because of the interweb, grew and grew because I asked people just for their retros, uh, uh, their memories of working with R. Crumb and Peter Begg and, and Aileen Kaminsky Crumb and Ron Turner. And uh, it just grew into this huge thing. And... I couldn't put it in a magazine. It got to be just too big. And so I, I wrote up a list of all the, all the people that, uh, who wrote uh, uh, reminiscences and uh, uh, testimonials. And uh, I went to San Diego Comic-Con and I approached Ron. And it had this list of, I don't know, 40 names, 50 names. And Ron's eyes just grew bigger, big as saucers and just <laughs> nodded. And... That was the drug. They accepted doing the book. Of course, they published Weirdo Magazine. And they were the first people I went to. And I always liked Ron. Uh, I always uh, tried to get uh, him uh, in, in my magazine and stuff. And he's like, well, maybe, maybe, maybe. But uh, that was a wonderful thing. And uh, so we did this mag. And, you know, Crumb thinks I'm a nut for doing it. Um, but we, we, I just went 
all out and it got to be 130 people contributed to it and uh we did a tour last year i mean we had an incredible year last year for this book the re reception for the book has been great it's been wonderful and crumb came from france with aileen and uh, we had a thing at columbia university and that was just and ron came and colin was there and it was just it was just wonderful um but then i just i would come up with ideas and i'd say well, you know, the world's going to an end, so uh, how about Slow Death? How about doing an issue of Slow Death, which is their horror, echo, ecological horror magazine? And uh, Colin and Ron just kind of nodded and said, yeah. And I said, well, what about a 50th anniversary book of Last Gas? You know, where we can, which is, we're just really starting that right now. But we have done, uh, we finished up Slow Death Comics uh, Zero, we call it and uh, it's it's ready to go but this darn you know COVID-19 is kind of in the way right now we don't know where the comic industry is going but I know it's going to see print uh it is yeah and Bill Stout did the cover and uh it was just got Rich Corbin in it and uh, it's just wonderful it's just <clears throat> wonderful to work mm -hmm. at and you know it's the I'm really really deep into the history of Last Gasp and it's a wonderful company and it's just that that you guys have survived for so long, and I completely see by all of your t uh, con this this discussion dialogue that's going on today of that it's the love of Ron, you know, and it's also uh, Ron's love of art, and uh, and Colin, you're a great guy too. <laughs> that's Colin my best. Huh? What's that? So I think I'm Colin turn is the best. Right there. You are. I'm going to turn over here to Mr. Ron Turner uh, to kind of wrap us up here. Okay, is William still on there? Robert, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, Ron. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about you, thinking about what a uh, what a civic father you are there in San Francisco. I don't think people quite understand that. That you, that you got your aging tentacles all over that town. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you're you're an institution, a, a one man red bearded institution there. And you, you you got more quiet gossip than most people can uh, expel in a lifetime. You know, and, uh, you, you you know a lot. You know, and uh, I I can't give you enough credit. You know, maybe I give you too much credit. I don't know, but. Uh, uh, I I, do, every, the, everybody uh, in that underground world has at one time or another, you know, had to kneel before your throne. So I don't Jesus. know what to say. You landed on pretty thick today, Robert. Throne. Where's the throne? <laughs> well, I, I just have been so happy and uh, uh, to be part of all of this. I mean, if, if and when I ever retire, uh, I think I'm going to hope to take a course in art. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Because I don't know anything really about art. It's you just, can apprentice uh, with me, Ron. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I remember the first time I met Ron. I, it was in 1969, and I was coming out with my own Coochie Cootie comics, and Ron got me off to the side, and he was uh, trying to tell me he wanted to publish it. Uh, and I thought, God, here's just another slick talking character, man, you know. And he, uh, you know, I said, Well, what kind? What do you got like for an advance? He says, Well, I, I have no advance. I thought, Oh Christ, you know. And then, uh, man, uh, the tables turned, and you turned out to be the the, the only solid uh, rock in the quarry, to, so to speak. You know? and, uh, well, it was uh, the the worst thing was to see, you know. Uh, I think a lot of cartoonists came over to the, some of the meetings we had just because for the free wine, you know, and, uh, you know, they were living very poorly. And so the first thing that I did was I made sure that I paid everybody their entire royalties for the, you know, when we printed a comic book, you know, and that was like, uh, that way there could be no things about, oh, you never paid me, or you never did this or that. No, you got all your money now, and then it's up to us to sell the books. Well, yeah, it worked sometimes. It worked, did work other times, but overall, it was a good good idea. You know? It sure saved on a lot of bookkeeping. I'll tell you. <laughs> hey, Ron, so, I just wanted to say something that you know these books that you published is not just about you know people always look and they think, oh, these are picture books, and they're not. The writing in these books that you've produced over the years, 
I mean, is exceptional. The the academic side, the the fun, the inside jokes, the sidelines. I mean, everything that's in these books. I mean, you always like pushed us to get the best writers. Everything was edited to T, and um, we really tried to produce something that was quality. It, 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 you 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 held the bar for us, and I'm so grateful for that because uh, we we gave that to the artists and. You know, again, I can't thank the writers enough. We've had incredible editors, incredible um, people work on the design. And Ron, you were you were looking and overseeing everything. So I'm just so pleased that we're able to honor you on this 50th uh, anniversary. For sure. I wish we had more time because every one of those books has some big back stories to them. You they know. do. They're really hard oh, I know. stories and things. When I go through the list, I think we're, we're probably over our time here. Um, you know, but yeah, when I go through the list, you know, it, it's just every book, you know, book after book, there's a story, there's a, mm -hmm. you know, either about the making of or who, you know, what the book is about, tell, you know, it's just endless. Mm -hmm. Can I yeah, say one so thing, many... Colin? Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, if you think about if you guys didn't exist and weren't here for these tw 50 years, um, the hole that would exist mm -hmm. to document this kind of art and make it a part of history you know you think about in the past how many movements or artists have been lost to history just by not having any record of their work so thank you for that because yeah. long after we're gone and the paintings are lost or burned up or whatever the the diaspora of the books being out in people's collections really creates that um sense of like okay this happened and here's the record of it and here's how it's all connected so thank you for that no i feel like that i probably wouldn't still have a career i don't think a lot of us would have had a career without ron and um yeah. kinko's probably would have had a lot of really great ambitious employees <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little, bit of a whole bunch of little comic books <laughs> but yeah. like a lot of this art probably it wouldn't even got created because we, we couldn't right. survive you know yeah yeah it's true. But yeah, Ron always just, he didn't, he still doesn't feel like a real person. He feels like a fictional character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, gonna be just a, I'm just another blow up doll. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Ron. yeah. There, there's a whole other world. Uh, and people always talk about the art world, you know, they think of the art world. And then, but they feel of the art world that's like either they're not smart enough or they're getting hoodwinked. But there's also another world, and that's this these little this book and this collect the collection of books are kind of a testament to that too. So it's mm -hmm. evidence that even while this other stuff, you know, and, and they they go back and forth, but this that that, that it did exist and it does exist, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of the movement or the time. You know, it's it's something that's uh, it's always going under going on even if you don't see it. What what's not been mentioned here about Ron and Las Gasp is when he started out in the underground publishing business, we were in the middle of a war and the country had a good chance of swinging right wing really heavy. And there was talk about rounding up subversive people and they were talking about reconditioning the internment camps. There was a serious, serious situation there where there could have been a uh, uh, a turning point where we all, everyone involved in the underground could have really done some time. And because of the, people like Ron Turner doing underground publications, it changed the public's opinion. And he's pretty, that, that fact there could be, later be seen in television and radio and music and whatnot. But it basically started in underground comics and underground newspapers and college newspapers and stuff. And that was very, very important. It means nothing now. It, 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 but to have to have an underground publishing company back then, you, there, there wasn't like distributors you could go to. Now there's distributors. You take it for granted. Back then, somebody like Ron or the print men or these these people, they had to go ferret out their own forms of distribution. And that was not an easy job because a lot of people that, that, that took on these comic books and whatnot, they got arrested. So there's a lot more dr drama to this story than it's just a bunch of hippies bought the stuff and now there's last gasp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there seems to be a longer documentary, Colin. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I apologize to everybody for how, how short this format is and, you know, but I appreciate everyone's time and um, everyone being here. 
uh, and your voices of, of support. And, uh, you know, so we couldn't be here without you. Thank you. Yeah, this is Thank wonderful. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. I just love the fact that we can all be, you know, we're, we're in a big room together, but it's just <laughs> us. And there's not a hundred people pulling at our arms or legs or buying us a drink mm -hmm. or something, you know. I know, we never get involved. to have things like this, you know? It's a, a party without the germs. <laughs> Best Comic-Con well, ever. I'm, 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 I'm leaving. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Robert, it was good to hear you. I'm going to go back and get in my position. I'm going to go back and get in line at the Trump rally. I'll talk to you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll see you there, man. I'll see you there. Yeah. I got some coronavirus for you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring the right, five towers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thanks, all right. Everybody. Thanks, everybody. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you, Ron. Happy anniversary. Thanks for having me. It's beautiful. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.